Hey guys, Jay Young with Young Red Angus. Thanks for making this video a part of your day. Today's video, we're going to be talking about interseeding cover crops into your milo, uh, specifically just the beginning stages of what we're doing here um, on our farming operation. This is the first year that we've interseeded cover crops when we drilled our milo. I've interseeded cover crops in our milo two years ago. It was kind of a disaster. Um, but this is looking fairly good. And so I wanna just get into the what we picked or the, the why and kind of talk about what we picked and how it's going so far. And then I'll do a follow-up video later on this fall and let you know how harvest went on this particular video. So we're gonna roll the intro and get into it. And this is what we Guys, today's episode is sponsored by Green Cover. Go to greencover.com to check out the cover crop seed options that they have, including all the cover crops and Coe's Milo that we talk about in today's episode. So greencover.com. The first thing I'd like to talk about is what did we put in this particular mix? Uh, the Milo, we kind of upped our population a little bit and we planted that at 3.7. Um, I'd like that to be closer to three or two and a half. Um, in the past, I've done four pounds, um, but we get into a dry year and the stuff planted at four pounds just really burns up. Um, so anyway, that's what the, the population that the Coes was planted at. The rest of it I have written down here. We had African cabbage at half a pound, brown flax at three pounds, okra at half a pound, the cucumber blend at half a pound, uh, crimson clover at half a pound, cow peas at three pounds, buckwheat at five pounds, red clover at two pounds, and nitro radish at one pound. So that's the, the mix that we use to interseed cover crops into our corn. I use the same mix for our Milo, but what we did was is this is at, uh, the sh we're shooting for 16 pounds uh, an acre on our irrigated corn. And so for this Milo, I back down to six pounds of this. So <clears throat> really we're cutting that uh, almost to a third of what these populations are. Um, so really thin on a lot of those that ha only had half a pound. Uh, the thickest thing that you're gonna see out here is the buckwheat. So I'm gonna just take you through the mix real quick and we'll look at everything that's in here um, so I can kind of show you how it looks as you walk through here. Okay guys, we're gonna take a stroll through the cover crops here and just kind of go over the stuff that's in here. Right away, um, I'm coming up to this buckwheat plant I love having buckwheat in the system. Um, it has, I've heard this so many times and I forget how it, it works, but basically buckwheat makes phosphorus more available to the following crop and it's not buckwheat, it's the relationship it has with the uh, microbiology within your soil. Uh, I've heard what that relationship is so many times, but I, off the top of my head, I can't think of it well enough to explain it. So uh, we'll just keep moving on here. Um, we got some clover. It's either red or crimson clover right here. Um, we got cow peas right here. I love the cow peas because I like this plant right here is vining up the side of the Milo plant and attaching itself to it. Um, um, I like both of those for fixing nitrogen. They don't fix a ton of nitrogen, but I always like to get two legumes uh, in our mix. And those are two I, I wanted to pick because I didn't think that they would necessarily affect the harvest of the uh, the Milo and the clover. Uh, I like it because it's gonna overwinter and provide a, a root structure out here over the winter. Um, we also have uh, daikon ra or African cabbage um, and daikon radish. So the African cabbage is gonna be the one with the yellow flowers and daikon radish is gonna be the one with the white flower as it's coming up. And you can tell by the leaf structure if you've planted a couple of times what the difference is on those. We have flax right over here. Here is an okra plant right down in here. Uh, we have the festive gourd blend in there. So I've seen a lot of things. I've seen the, uh, looks like cantaloupe maybe growing in here. I don't know, it's cantaloupe or a, a pumpkin. Got some huge squash plants right down here. Uh, zucchini, uh, cucumbers. And so we have uh, that in the mix, but it's not as high as of a population 
of what I did. I just thought it'd be fun to f throw it out here. Okay guys, here we are a day later filming this YouTube video because once again, I got the uh, temperature is too hot on your phone to continue to use your phone, whatever that stupid warning is. Um, so here we are. So I think the question that comes to most people's mind is, why would you do this? Won't the cover crops take out too much moisture uh, from the growing cash crop? And then also, um, won't it be taking out mic micronutrients and macronutrients and using up your phosphorus and your, your nitrogen and competing with the plants? Um, yes, they will be taking out moisture, but plants share micronutrients with other plants. Um, and the theory is that that makes it more drought tolerant. I've seen it on our own farm uh, in 2019. We had uh, corn on a dry land field that was burning up and our cover crops that had corn in it with a much higher population of plants per acre wasn't burning up. So that's when I realized even our dry land, we need to be getting cover crops interceded into our cash crops and figuring that out. It's just a matter of finding out the cover crops so you can plant with your cash crop um, because you're not gonna have a huge amount of diversity. You want like 90% of your cash crop planted and you know, or yeah, and sorry, you want like a huge amount of your population being your cash crop being planted and then a lower population of your cover crops. So finding that balance between what cover crops and what populations of cover crops can be planted within say your Milo or your corn in a dry land system and still be a plus benefit to your corn is gonna be a challenge, uh, but that's a challenge that I, I'm excited about. And so that's why we are doing it is that in theory, uh, the plants will be more drought tolerant because they're sharing micronutrients. And also because they're sharing the nutrients with, with uh, plants are sharing the nutrients with other plants. In theory, like as these, the Milo is filling its grain, it's gonna be a more nutrient dense finished product because it's grown in a regenerative system where plants are sharing nutrients with one another. Plus, if you're building up your fungal populations within your field, then those fungus, the fungus and the bacteria are gonna be bringing the plant more nutrients um, than it would in a traditional system. Um, so that's why we're doing it. Uh, it's not without its challenges. This is the first time I've grown toes. I love it for how tall it is. I mean, it's gonna get huge. Uh, you can already see by how tall it is now. Some of these plants are already uh, six feet tall um, and we're, we're not even past, you know, filling the, the grain out and the, the maturity. It's just now flowering um, on the, the Milo here. So really excited about that on the Coes, but uh, because the Coes didn't have any kind of uh, insecticide on it, uh, I had a, I think some of the populations affected a little bit by like by that. So I wish I would have raised up my population of Coes. Um, I'd like to see the stand of the Coes a little bit thicker. Other than that, I'm really pleased with it. Uh, you know, Green Cover told me that you can expect um, 70 to 80 percent of what your normal uh, yield would be on Milo when you're when you're growing Coes. But the main reason I'm growing it is is for being able to save back this seed for you know forage crops in the future. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm kind of excited about the way it looks. Uh, it, it it I don't like that it's thinner. Um, but this is an experiment that I'm excited how it's going. Um, and so it's definitely something we're going to try in the future. One other thing I want to bring up, I love the habitat that this is creating for the beneficial insects out here, like this butterfly. Uh, that's really cool. One caution I would have for you if you're wanting to try this is number one, make sure you're planting into a field that doesn't have uh, a lot of weed pressure going in when you plant uh, going into it, because once you get this, these cover crops out here, there's no spraying it uh, after the cover crops are planted. So I've noticed quite a bit of devil's claws. Um, that's another thing that it, you know you have to look out for in the future if you have a weed like devil's claws. Um, for those of you who don't know, devil's claws is puts out a pod that has you know hooks on it, and then those pods will ball up into these huge balls that can really wreak havoc on your planters um, and you know for guys that still sweep you know it, it messes up their, their pickers so it's not a system that you can probably go into year in and year out the following year on this I'm probably gonna plant corn 
without interceding cover crops in it because I'll need to spray to kill those devil's claws plants um, so that that doesn't become an issue in the future. Um, so, you know, going to systems like these is, is something I want to go to in the future, but it's not without its, its challenges. You have to be thinking about that weed pressure and problems that that might cause going forward. Um, harvesting. So as long as um, it doesn't fall over, it looks like, you know, the way this milo is going to be so tall, it's going to be taller than the buckwheat. And I'm not going to have to worry about harvesting buckwheat with the milo. If it falls down, lodging could, I mean, lodging could in theory be something that we face with this particular variety because it's so tall. If it does fall down, then we probably are going to harvest some buckwheat. I have a seed cleaner uh, that we just purchased this year that's you know to be determined how well we get it clean so that's something that i don't know the answer to that it's just we're gonna find out I, I make these videos because i want other people to be trying the crazy things that we're trying because i think that that's what is going to in the future make us better as a nation uh and in the world at, at farming and make us more successful in a regenerative system so um this is a, a video uh showing you hey I've got it all figured out, do this, and it's gonna work amazing. This is a, hey, this is what we're trying. I hope it inspires you and encourages you to do crazy things on your operation uh, that are gonna push the envelope and help all of us get to a place where we're finding what systems of regenerative agriculture are going to work best in the different dry and arid environments that we find ourselves in. Um, and so that's why I make these videos. I, I hope this video is helpful. If you guys have thoughts and comments about what to put in a future video, let me know. Keep pursuing soil health. And this is Jay Young out.